I invite you to open a Bible to John chapter 14 as we continue looking at the I am statements of Jesus found in the gospel of John. And our goal with this sermon series and this study of God's word is that we would come to a greater knowledge and understanding and trust in who our Jesus is as our Lord and Savior, that we would get to know him better and know his grace and his mercy and his love for each and every one of us better. And in John chapter 14, Jesus gives one of his most famous I am statements, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So how many of you are familiar with that one, right? It's read at funerals, it's used as evangelism tools, it's used in apologetics, it's used all kinds of places to talk about salvation and eternal life being found in Jesus. And while that's true, that's not what I'm going to talk about right now. So most of you who know me now know that I care about teaching you how to read the Bible, not just that I get up and talk to you, but I want you to walk away better understanding God's Word. And one of the things we want to do when we read God's Word is read it in context. And so the first thing that Jesus says in this passage in verse 1 is, let not your hearts be troubled. That is the whole purpose of his speech that he's about to give. Even his statement, I am the way, the truth, and life. His whole message, his whole point for you and me and the disciples at the time is this command and promise of let not your heart be troubled. Now, how many of you, when Jesus said something, think it's good and something you should listen to? Okay. That's not a trick question. I'm not trying to mess with you, okay? Right? When Jesus says something, he tells us something, gives us a command. Most of us, if we believe in him and trust in God's word, think what? That's a good idea. I should do that, right? Now, how many of you go out into the world after hearing Jesus and you simply do it? Like all the time, perfectly, right? Like, this is the conundrum, right? There are lots of passages where Jesus tells us to do something as his followers, right? He either gives us a word of comfort or challenge. He gives us a promise or a command. And we go, oh, I should apply that to my life. And some of them we don't like. And I know you're in church. You're like, no, pastor, I love everything Jesus says. No, you don't. Because a lot of times he tells us multiple times, forgive people. By the way, you only have to forgive people that have hurt you. Like all the people that are super duper nice to you all the time, guess what you don't have to do with them? Forgive them, <laughs> right? So he's saying the people that have wounded you or hurt you or harmed somebody that you love and it's caused you pain, I want you to forgive them. I want you to love your enemies and to pray for them. How many of you pray for your family members? All right? Anybody, like some of you might keep like a prayer journal right, or something like that, you keep a list of people who are praying for, how many of you in that list, whether it's written down or in your heart, and you've got your list of loved ones that you're praying for, also keep a separate list that says, here are the enemies that I'm also praying for by name, because Jesus told me to. Okay, some of you are really good. Now, I'll ask later privately, are you praying loving things for them? <laughs> are you keeping that list for other reasons where you're just like, you know, Lord, you smited some people in the Bible, it could be, right? That's also not how Jesus told us to pray for enemies, because he said, I want you to love your enemies, right? It's easy to love our family and friends that are kind and reciprocate that kindness back to us, but when someone is against us or someone has a different worldview than us, and Jesus tells you over and over and over again in the Gospels, I want you to love, I want you to serve, I want you to pray for, I want you to forgive those kind of people, there's one part of us that when we're in church or we're hearing the words, we go, oh, Jesus is right. I mean, the world would be better if everybody just did what he said, right? If we all actually forgave our enemies rather than try to destroy each other, it would be better. So it's one thing when we're in church, we're hearing God's word, you're underlining it or whatever, and you go, oh, yeah, it's Jesus, it must be good, and we don't actually like it or want to do it. And then there's other times where Jesus gives us commands he gives us promises that are wonderful and beautiful in the Gospel of Matthew. He says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. How many of you like that one? You're, you're like, I'd rather do that than love 
my enemy and forgive them, right? I know I would. I'd rather just come take a, take a nap and get some rest for my soul with Jesus than have to go love and serve some certain people. But how many of you struggle with actually resting and just taking a break and letting go of control and saying, okay, Jesus, I'm going to trust you to be in control. Anybody struggle with that? So it's a beautiful promise. It's a beautiful command from Jesus. And yet, what do we do? Well, like, that's a good idea, Lord, but let me get all of this stuff done first, <laughs> and then I'll come to you and get some rest. In the Gospel of Matthew and the Beatitudes, Jesus says, do not worry about tomorrow. How many of you knew that already, that he said that, right? That's an easy command to understand, right? There's no, I got to check out the Greek. There's like, oh, let me read some commentary. It's just, don't worry about tomorrow. How many of you have ever read that, heard it, you saw it in a devotion, and the very next thing you did was go out and worry about tomorrow? Or you're like, oh, I didn't do it for tomorrow. It was like next Thursday, so I put it off a little bit, right? And so, again, it's a beautiful command of Jesus, isn't it? I don't want you. He's telling you, I love you so much. I will take care of you if you trust me. You won't have to worry about tomorrow. Man, that would take so much stress off, right? And yet, what do we do? I'm really good about worrying about tomorrow. Now, here's my point. The most common command that is found in your Bible, happens more than any other by hundreds, is God's command of don't be afraid or fear not, depending on how you want to translate it. It is the most common command that will be found in your Bible. That's what John 14, verse 1 says, right? Let not your hearts be troubled. It's a fancy way. It's a beautiful way of saying what? Don't be afraid, because how many of you have ever been in a season of life where you're worried, you're filled with fear, or stress, anxiety, you're concerned about tomorrow, and guess what? That means your heart is what? Troubled, right? You're losing sleep, you're not eating well, you're not doing the things you're supposed to do, you're not, like, all those things. Why? Because we have troubled hearts. And so Jesus is giving to you and me this incredibly beautiful promise and command. Don't let your heart be troubled. That's my whole sermon. Just go do that. <laughs> right? <laughs> that was, it's simple. How many of you understand the words Jesus is saying? It's not confusing, is it? How many of you have ever had, in the past week, a troubled heart over something? Yeah, I know I have, right? Now, if some of you have a little bit of idolatry and you have troubled heart over the Super Bowl later tonight, all right, just calm down, okay? I'm talking about, like, serious things, okay, guys, right? We, we know what Jesus is saying. We, we know it's good for us. I mean, how many of you would rather have a, a heart at peace than a troubled heart? That would be so much better. And Jesus is saying, this is what I want for you. So how do we get there? Because that's the real question, right? Like, oh, that was, well, great, Jesus, no, have no troubled heart, right? It's the old adage of someone tells you, don't think about it, don't worry about it, don't be afraid, and your response is, well, that's easy for you to say. Anybody have ever lashed out at a loved one? Because <laughs> they're like, don't worry about it. You're like, well, that's easy for you to say, because what? It's not their problem. It's not their issue. It's not their troubled heart. So there is a way we could hear Jesus say this of don't worry. Don't be afraid. Don't let your heart be troubled. And for us to kind of speak back to Jesus, well, that's kind of easy for you to say because you're God. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. <laughs> But there's are times, I'm assuming, I know in my own life, probably in yours, where there's been times where it's like, oh, don't be afraid. Oh, don't worry about tomorrow. Oh, don't let your heart be troubled. That sounds great, Jesus. That must be easy for you to say because you're God and you don't have my problems. You don't have my concerns. You don't, going through this circumstance or this situation. So what are we doing? Well, Jesus is giving us this promise 
for a reason. And in the context of it is that the disciples in this moment have troubled hearts. In John chapter 13, the previous story, right, the story doesn't just end and then like a week later, John 14, okay, it's all the same moment. Jesus is telling the disciples, I'm going away. I'm leaving. And that sends fear and worry and concern into their hearts. The other thing that Jesus tells the disciples in John chapter 13 is that they will all abandon him. And then he specifically talks to Peter because Peter speaks up and is like, I'll follow you anywhere, right? How many of you have acted like Peter? You're like, Lord, I will obey you. I will do whatever you want in my life. I'm going to follow you all the time until I walk out those doors and stuff happens and then maybe not. And he looks at Peter and he tells Peter, you're going to deny me three times. So if you're the disciples in this moment, and Jesus, who you've been following every single day for three years, tells you, I'm going away, and you can't follow me. You can't go where I'm going. And then he looks at you and says, hey, later tonight when I'm betrayed and arrested and beaten for things I didn't do, Someone's going to ask you, do you know that guy? Do you love him? And your response is going to be, never met him. Don't know him at all. Now, I know you know the stories because of Good Friday and Easter story. But if you're in that moment, right, and this is, by the way, they're washing their feet. They're all sitting down at a dinner table. Anybody had an awkward dinner table moment with some family and friends? And you're like... (laughs) You're like, everything's going great. And all of a sudden, you're like, I have a troubled heart, Lord. If you're the disciples in this moment, guess what you're going to have? Troubled heart. You're going to have a lot of fear and anxiety. Worry about, what do you mean you're going away and we can't follow you? What does that mean for the future? By the way, that's what we always worry about. It's the future. (laughs) What's going to happen? We're always worrying about tomorrow. So what are the disciples doing? We've got a lot of fear right now. Jesus, about tomorrow. We've got a lot of fear, Jesus, about what you're going to think of me after I deny you. See, I think Jesus is giving us this word of promise and to the disciples because he knows in this life, guess what we're going to have at times? Really troubled hearts. And there's two ways this promise becomes real for you and me. The first is when we sin. If you don't like that word, think of it when you make a mistake, right? And you tell everybody, well, no one's perfect. That's always our defense, right? So the first is when you and I are like Peter and we deny Jesus. Now, I don't mean it in the sense that someone is going to walk up to you after service and go, do you believe in Jesus? And be like, I never heard of him. But every time you and I sin, Every time we see what Deuteronomy talks about, life and death, and the the path of God's way versus the path of my way, and we choose our own selfish desires, our own selfish ways rather than Jesus, guess what we're doing like Peter? We're sinning, we're denying him and saying, I don't really care about him. I don't really want him in my life. I, I wanna go my way. And when we do that, Satan loves to come in and attack our hearts and our souls and say, oh, how could you do that? Anybody ever done something and later on when you're in a better state of mind, you ask yourself, what was I thinking? Right, I can't believe I did that. Why why did I say that? That was so dumb, right? And what happens is Satan comes in and says, well, I want you to be overwhelmed in your sin with a troubled heart filled with guilt and shame. And if you keep reading the story, you know what happens to Peter, right? When he denies Jesus, guess what he's overwhelmed with? A a troubled heart. He's, He's literally heartbroken and weeping, and he runs away in fear and guilt and shame. And that's what we do. We sin, we mess up, we choose our own way rather than God's way, and eventually, guess what? 
you, you feel guilty about it. You feel ashamed about it. One of the ways that I, I encounter this in pastoral counseling is sometimes people will tell me, I should be better by now. And what they mean by that is, I, I should be more mature. I shouldn't be struggling with that thing, that sin, anymore in my life. Right? You ever done that? Where you, anybody ever had to confess the exact same sin more than once? If you show up on Sunday, you're like, dear Lord, I'm sorry to bother you, but here we are again. And I know last week I, I said I was sorry, and you meant it. You're like, I want to do better. Anybody ever gone out and done worse, even when you had the best intentions? And guess what? Over time, Satan creeps in and goes, I'm going to make sure your heart is really troubled about that. I want to make sure your heart is overwhelmed with guilt and shame. So that like Peter, instead of running towards Jesus for his grace and mercy, we're going to run away and hide in fear. Now here's the deal. The very verses right before Jesus makes this wonderful promise of don't let your hearts be troubled is when he tells Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Now think about that. He looks right at Peter at the dinner table and tells him face to face, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And the very next thing he says is, don't let your heart be troubled. Again, if I'm Peter, I'm going, what? <laughs> right? Like, I'm not going to feel at, at peace in that moment, right? You're going to look at Jesus and go, well, that must be easy for you to say because you're not going to be denying anybody, right? If you were in a, a heart-aching, stressful moment, and in that moment, before you've ended any time to assess the situation, calm down, think about it, someone goes, don't worry about it. How many of you are going to go, oh, well, God, I feel so much better now? Right? Think about Peter. Jesus looks right at you at a dinner table and says, you're going to deny me three times. And the very next thing he says is, but don't let your heart be troubled. How many of you are going to have a really troubled heart in that moment, no matter what Jesus just said? Right? And that's what life looks like. We, didn't, we sin, we mess up, we reject Jesus' way of life, we go in our own path, and the whole time, he's looking at you and me in his grace and mercy going, but don't let your heart be troubled. Now, the other thing that Jesus is speaking this promise into is the concern on the disciples' hearts about the reality of an unknown future. Because he's telling them in chapter 13, I'm going away, and you can't follow me. And if you were listening in John chapter 14, verse 5, Thomas says to Jesus, Lord, we do not know where you're going, so how can we know the way? All right? How many of you have heard the Bible verses and you, you believe them, right, in your head? You know, hey, this is true. It's God's word. That God is in control of everything and he's got a plan. Show of hands. You've, you've heard it. And when you're in church and you go, well, it's in the Bible, and that's wonderful. And how many of you are like, I like Thomas, <laughs> which is, I don't know the plan, <laughs> right? That's what he's saying. Jesus is like, hey, I'm going away, but I'm going to come back, and, and, and you'll know the way. Don't worry about it. And Thomas speaks for everybody when he goes, you know, Jesus, is really great that you got a plan, and everything's under your control. I just want to let you know. We took a vote as a group of disciples. We decided none of us know the plan. <laughs> That's what he's saying, right? None of us know the way. You just, you just talked about you're going somewhere. We all would like to follow you, right? That's what we do, right? I want to follow the Lord's plan for my life. One of the most common questions you'll get when you become a pastor is, what is God's will? I love it when you ask me that, by the way, because I, I know all of them. <laughs> That's why I don't worry about tomorrow. But what do we do, right? We're like, oh, God's will, God's plan. I, we're like the disciples. I want to follow him. I want to be in line with God's plan. But then every once in a while, you pause like Thomas, and you think about it for a moment, and you're like, I don't, 
actually know the plan here. I know God's got one. I know he's in control, and that should comfort us, and sometimes it does. But I know from my own troubled heart, sometimes not knowing his will, not knowing the plan, feeling like Thomas of, I'm not sure what the next step or the way is, does what? Cause fear, right? Earlier I asked you, how many of you have ever worried about tomorrow? You know what you did in that moment? Well, you knew God had a plan and God's in control of all things, and yet what did you do? You worried because guess what? I didn't know the plan. (laughs) I don't know how everything's gonna work out. Anybody ever had a troubled heart because of that? Hey, I know God's got a plan. I know Romans 8. Many of you have Romans 8 memorized, right? God works all things for the good of those who love him. It's a beautiful promise. But how many of you ever wondered, okay, he's working all things for our good, but exactly how is this all going to work out? And when we ask those questions, we're struggling. It's, it's common to have a troubled heart, to have some fear, to worry about tomorrow. And so Jesus, in the middle of all of this concern, because he knows the disciples in John 13 and 14 are worried about Tomorrow, they're they're concerned about what is this unknown future? I don't have the answers. I don't know the next step. I don't know the plan. He knows you're going to have a troubled heart in those moments. So he makes this promise. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Now, again, (laughs) it's beautiful. It's true and it's good, right? Right? And we'd all agree, I'd rather have a heart at peace than a troubled heart. But when I'm like the disciples and Thomas, and it's like, you got a plan, Lord, but I don't know it. I can't see the next step. I can't see the way. So we have to be honest with the Lord and say, I've got a troubled heart. When I was a 14-year-old freshman in high school, I became a Christian. And my first week as a Christian, I gave my first sermon, which I don't recommend as a strategy, but um, I did it. And I thought, well, this would be a great idea. I love the Lord. I'm going to tell people about Jesus. I asked my youth pastor if I could do it. He said, yeah, that'd be great. Showed up to youth group. My brother, who's also a pastor now, and I think he loves me sometimes when we were growing up. (laughs) He found out, oh, Mark's going to give the message. I'm going to tell all my friends. Now, I don't know if he did that as a big brother who was proud of me or if he was a big brother that wanted to mess with me. Anybody got siblings where you're kind of on the fence there? You're just like, I think think he's doing this out of love, but I don't know, (laughs) right? So I show up to youth group, and 120 high school students are sitting there staring at me. And I'm a freshman. I didn't stand there, and I'm looking at the microphone, and I go, this was a terrible idea. <laughs> and then I walked outside because a few minutes before we were supposed to get started because my youth pastor was like, yeah, go talk to the Lord and calm down a bit. And I was like, oh, I'm going to talk to the Lord about his plan right now. <laughs> Anybody ever done that? You're like, oh, don't have a troubled heart. Oh, you got a plan, Lord? Well, let's talk. Let's talk about this for a moment because I've got a troubled heart because of your plan. Is what it feels like. Now, in the great irony of things, I was terrified in that moment. And I've shared this with you all many times. I have an anxiety disorder, and worry is a constant thing for me. And so God's always like, oh, why don't you talk about worry? So the first sermon I ever gave was on Jesus' command in the Beatitudes, don't worry about tomorrow. And I was like, looking back, I'm like, this is a funny guy. <laughs> Don't worry about tomorrow. Okay, well, I'm petrified doing this right now. Now, it wasn't a great sermon at all. And this was basically the gist of it was, you know, this is what I, okay, I've gotten better since then. I'm just (laughs) recapping what happened then, okay? Don't don't judge 14-year-old Pastor Mark, okay? I got up. And I talked about how I struggled with worry and anxiety about school every single day. And I talked about how dumb it is. And I just looked at this crowd of people and I said, worry is stupid. And I thought it was profound. Okay. <laughs> now, if you think about it, it is on one hand, right? Because Jesus says what? 
don't do it. So it must be dumb to do if Jesus is saying, I don't want that for you, don't do that. And in the context, Jesus is saying, here's why I don't want you to worry, because I'm giving you all these promises of how I'm gonna take care of you and provide for you each and every day. And I was like, see, we're so stupid, we're so dumb every time we worry because we're not trusting in Jesus to take care of us. And then my big conclusion was, I looked at everybody and goes, Jesus says, don't worry, so you're stupid if you do, let's pray. (laughs) Like I said, I've improved a little bit since before I got here, just a little bit. Now, I will still call you dumb and stupid sometimes because we are, as human beings, what? We're dumb and stupid. We don't always do what God wants us to do, right? Now, here's the deal. A lot of people thanked me for that sermon. (laughs) I don't know why, (laughs) but they did. And that was like the launching point for God's plan for my life. But when I think about it, these promises from Jesus, don't worry. Don't have a troubled heart. Even though they are beautiful and good and comforting for us, They don't always sound like that, right? Sometimes it sounds like someone just shouting at you, you're dumb and stupid for doing this, right? Because think about it, if you're in a moment, a season of life, a situation where your heart is troubled, you're struggling with guilt and shame, or you're worried and you have a lot of fear about the future, someone comes up to you and says, you know, one time Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled. How many of you are gonna hug your friend and tell them, thank you, I feel so much better now? Right, or is it gonna sound like 14-year-old Pastor Mark going, you know, you're kind of being stupid right now for worrying about it because Jesus said, don't worry. In my experience, it's usually the second one. (laughs) It doesn't always come across as this beautiful promise. But here's the deal, how in the world when our hearts are troubled, whether it's by sin and guilt and shame, or it's trouble about the unknown future, are you and I able to take Jesus' promise seriously? How are we to take this command seriously in our hearts and say, I'm not gonna let my heart be troubled by this anymore? And the answer is his promise when he says the I am statement. When he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except by me, right? That verse is usually ripped out of its context, and it's, in my experience, growing up in the Bible, it was used to beat people over the head, right? Of like, you need to believe or you're gonna burn in hell, right? It's, it's used in apologetic. Jesus is giving that statement as a word of comfort and promise to you and me and to his disciples. You know how I know that? Because they're all freaking out. Peter just got told, you're gonna deny me three times. The disciples just got told, you're gonna abandon me in my time of need. They just got told by Jesus, your future is gonna seem uncertain and unknown because I've gotta go away for a little while. And Thomas's question is, how do we know the way? How do we know where you're going? He's essentially asking, what's the plan and how can we be with you and follow you through all the unknowns and all the uncertainties of life? And Jesus responds to him and says, Thomas, troubled heart people, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's a word of promise and comfort for you and me when our hearts are troubled of how can I know the next step in my life? How can I know that I'm not gonna fall flat on my face? And Jesus says, because you know me and I am the way. How can I know when my heart is troubled by sin and guilt and shame that I am actually loved and redeemed and forgiven by God? And Jesus says, you can know that because you know me and I am the truth. And Jesus says, the truth sets you free from all of that. And how can you and I know that we have a future and a hope of eternal life? Because a lot of times in my experience, our hearts are most troubled when we're facing death or the death of a loved one. And Jesus is telling his disciples, you can know that. 
You can know that you're gonna be with me. You can know that you're gonna conquer death, that you're gonna live forever and eternity with him because he says, you know me and I am the life. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he is giving to you and me a promise to comfort our troubled hearts. That we get to know him as the one who guides our lives and our steps. He's the one who sets us free from sin and guilt and shame with his grace and forgiveness. And he's the one who gives us the promise of eternal life. I want to share with you two passages to remind you of this when you have a troubled heart. The first is Romans chapter 5, verse 20. So Romans chapter 5, verse 20 says, Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Think about that for Peter. He didn't just deny Jesus once, did he? Imagine, I like to think about that moment for Peter. Do you think his, his feelings of guilt and shame are increasing with each denial? The first one, I feel bad. I can't believe I did that. Second one, many of us have said, I can't believe I did that again. And then you get to the third one. I guess that's just who I am, right? A lot of times Satan attacks us with that of like, well, you've done it so many times, that must just be who you are. And what God's word gives to you and me in our troubled hearts is his promises. Yeah, where there is sin, grace abounds even more. And I love that word abounds, abundant, meaning it's not just like you're scraping the bottom of the barrel, like is there a little bit left over for this sin? Is there just a little, is there just enough to get me through this week? The word abound here means a pot that boils over. It's literally the picture of it. And so Paul's saying, yeah, where there is sin, where there is a troubled heart that's overwhelmed with guilt and shame, the grace of Jesus overflows in your life and abounds for you. So when you and I have a troubled heart about our sin and our guilt and our shame, we can take comfort in the words of Jesus. Well, he is my life. And he is the truth of the gospel. And I have him. And since I have him, I have grace that overflows and abounds. Now, if you're like me, and you hear Jesus say, don't worry about tomorrow, and your response is, I'll work on that tomorrow. (laughs) I've got one more Bible verse for you. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. For we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. For we, you and me, the ones with the troubled hearts, the ones that are still worrying about tomorrow, are because of Jesus receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the A lot of times we are worried about tomorrow. We have troubled hearts because things feel unknown. We're like Thomas, what is the way? And where are you going? What's the plan, right? It feels like we're standing on shaky ground. It feels like I I don't know what the next step is. I don't know if the foundation is going to be secure for me. I don't know if God's really going to be there for me. And the response of Jesus and God's word is that through Jesus, you and I receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So even when there's a lot of stuff going on in the world and you feel totally justified of, I should have a troubled heart right now. I should be worried about tomorrow right now. We have this word of promise and comfort from God that says, but you, as a follower of Jesus, are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. It means nothing can take it away from you. Nothing can undo the promises of Jesus in your life. And no matter what comes our way, because Jesus is our life, we get the promise and the certainty that we get that kingdom with him forever. So here's the secret of not worrying about tomorrow, of not having a troubled heart. It's knowing who Jesus is as the way, the one who is guiding you each and every day of your life. 
He is the one who is the truth, who is setting you free from sin, guilt, and shame with his grace that abounds and abounds in your life. And he's the one who is the life, giving you the certainty that no matter what comes my way, I have a kingdom that cannot be shaken because of who Jesus is for me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you are the way, the truth, and the life, that you have come to Give us peace in our hearts, even when they feel overwhelmed with worry, fear, and trouble. Help us, Holy Spirit, by faith to trust in these promises of Jesus, that we would trade in our hearts that are troubled for hearts of peace, trusting in his promises each and every day. In your name we pray, amen.